Tim Henderson's Black and Gold Review is sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built for tough. And 2017 Nissan Titan. With America's best bumper-to-bumper -bumper limited truck warranty, Nissan Titan. Take on any job. And Slide Hill Memorial Hospital in partnership with Oshner. Freeman again. Right side, and he Bumble, drops the ball, ball, and the Saints have recovered. Here's Ryan on fourth and one. Devontae Freeman in. does not get there. How about this defense? When's the last time you've said that? How about that defense? How about that team? The Saints finally back in the playoffs once again. Welcome in once again alongside the man on that fantastic call, Jim Henderson. I'm Juan Kincaid. The biggest game of the year for this team, Jim, and they answered the call. And so did the fans. Biggest and best crowd of the year. They contributed to that win. Such a fun time being in a packed out dome on Sunday. Let's get you right to the headlines. Headline number one. There's still some unfinished business. Well, they knew after they lost to the Falcons on December 7th that if they won out, uh, being against the Jets, the Falcons again, and then finally against the Bucks, they would be the NFC South champions. They've accomplished the first two of those three games. What we do know about the Bucks is that they won't be an easy team to beat because they've been very close to beating both the Falcons and the Panthers already late in the season. Yeah, in the last two games of the season, in the last two weeks, they could easily have tied those games and sent them into overtime or perhaps beaten both of them. Now, as we look at where things stand right now, this unfinished business talk, the Saints are currently the fourth seed, but to get to the third seed, they have to beat the Bucs, hope the Rams lose to the 49ers, which could happen because they're playing fantastic football right now. That would mean the Saints would host either the Falcons or Seahawks in the wild card round. The Saints would remain at number four if they and the Rams both win or they and the Panthers both lose. If either happened, the Saints would host the Panthers in the wild card round of the playoffs. And then there's the what if thing, Jim, if the Saints lose and the Panthers win next Sunday, then the Saints would drop to number five. The Panthers would win the division, get the playoff game at home. The Saints would then have to hit the road to either Carolina, which would be difficult, mm -hmm. or in Los Angeles against the Rams, which would also be difficult. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing to do here now is just win your final game. You control your own destiny here. Get that home playoff game and go from there. Just win, baby. That's what Al Davis said, and it's never been truer. You're certainly right about that. Headline number two, no place like home for the holidays. <laughs> Especially when you play like you did yesterday. Seven and one record at home. That's the best since they were eight and zero in 2013. That was just great stuff yesterday. All the things that they did, uh, the banner trolling the Falcons 28-3 uh, lead in the Super Bowl outside. The 6-10 stompers when they put it out at midfield during halftime, the 28-3. Uh, uh, the Marta bus up on the big screen blocking the Falcon <laughs> player intros. And the touchdown towels was a really nice touch, too. And Steve Gleason being there, whenever he's on the field, it's a special day. And it seems like he brings out the best in the Saints when they're playing the Falcons. Drew Brees led the Houdat chant, as he should have yesterday. It was just a, a different kind of feeling inside the mm -hmm. dome. The fans, they asked the fans during the week to come be there early, be loud the entire game, and they certainly were. In fact, there was one time when the Saints, I think, had a fourth down call, and Breeze was having to quiet the fans, right. and they started the Houdat chant at the wrong time. <laughs> they were hyped yesterday. And they used the big screens to enforce that, too, with the yep. players saying, get loud, and the fans truly responded. This was a game, and I, we mentioned it often, ever since the final whistle in that December 7th loss to the Falcons, Everybody, I think, in New Orleans who regards himself as a Saints fan were pointing toward this one, and the fans were ready. They, they circled on the calendar, no doubt about, about that. All right, headline number three, fresh. Breeze. Well, he's setting another record. It almost goes without thinking a uh, week after week that he's going to break one. He's the fastest of 70,000 yards after what happened yesterday. You know, he got there in 248 career games. That's 10 fewer than Peyton Manning reached the 70K mark or 45 fewer than Brett Favre did. His completion percentage right now, if it holds up, would be an NFL record, beating Sam Bradford's mark sent just last season. Uh, Breeze has had 18 sacks against him, attempted 506 passes. He's just playing terrific, and for a change, he doesn't have to carry this yeah. team any longer, and uh, he's playing some of his best football of his career. That's what I was going to get to, because you look at the pass attempts of Drew Brees this year. Right now, he's only thrown the ball 506 times. That's the lowest mm. for him since 2009. He's on pace for 540, but it just adds to the claim that he doesn't have to do it all this year. He's got Kamara and Ingram behind him that have done taking a lot of load off of him. Yeah, and helping him with his percentage, too, and not that he really needs it, of completions yeah. because he doesn't have to force the ball downfield any longer. They're both excellent receivers, obviously, coming out of the backfield. He can throw safe check down passes to them. I would imagine Breeze gave the running backs a very good Christmas present mm -hmm. this year. Headline number four, and this is why they won the game on Sunday, win first and second down. 
That was something that Peyton stressed throughout the week. We want the fans to be loud, not just on third down, but on first and second down to make their third uh, down conversions more difficult. It certainly proved to be that. They were just 2 of 13 on third down. They had to gain an average of 7.6 yards to convert. They had a third and 30 at one point. That came after a first and 40. That's only the second such down in distance in the last 20 years, a first and 40. Uh, the Falcons, of course, had 10 penalties mm -hmm. to the Saints' three, and that helped as well. It was almost the exact opposite of the way the game was played <laughs> yep. and the flow of the game from Atlanta's game on December 7th. You're right about that. All right, headline number five, no ifs, <laughs> ands, or buts <laughs> about it. Unbelievable interception by Marshawn Lattimore. I don't think you'll ever see one like it again. It's prompted a lot of uh, very interesting calls <laughs> of that. It's a play that will live in history, and then you may never see this in this way again and you can see the ball just on the back just of Mark there. Lattimore's butt and then everybody realizes hey this isn't hit the ground this is still still a live ball and the fact that Marshawn Lattimore could come away with it you know he's had such a great year what's he got five interceptions yes, five now, now. Yes. and um, none will be more crucial or better than that one right there you're right and we got a bunch of nickname ideas for Lattimore's catch on our final play app and Facebook here are a few of our favorites Instead of being upset about the loss in Atlanta, we turned the other cheek <laughs> and clinched a playoff spot, leaving the Falcons behind. behind. That's that good. from Stephen Richards. Mm -hmm. The best booty call ever uh -huh, from like Tina that. Adams Mazika, mm -hmm. Mesquita. Bordeaux, uh, Boudreaux's butt pace, which I use that a lot of my daughter when she's a kid. Boudreaux's <laughs> butt pace sticking to everyone in Louisiana. <laughs> that from Adam Fletcherich. I got a big butt and the ball don't lie. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> Sir Mix a Lot, right? Who is it? Is. Uh, who, that's, that's, who your, that's, that's your favorite singer, Sir uh, Mix a Lot. Yeah. Right? I hear, I hear, oh, hear that song all the time. <laughs> I thought maybe we could call it the Rear Ender Year Ender. All right. But I don't know if it's better than any of those. Uh, Jeff Duncan had some great ones too. He did. And I found these on, uh, of course, Times Picking News headline today was Buns of Steel, S T E A L. Terrific. Gluteus Interceptus, <laughs> the Fanny Pick. You know, you have the fanny pack when of you course, were running sure, yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah. You have a f personal favorite? I know you said the one earlier. Of those three right there? Yeah, I like the buns of steel. was pretty good. I like that, but I like the gluteus interceptus. Gluteus interceptus. Yes. They're all good, though. They're all very good. Terrific. It's fantastic. Well done, fans. All right, still to come. Manti Teo spent his Sunday in the Falcons' backfield wreaking havoc. Sean Mazan is on deck next with a film study on the Saints' new number one middle linebacker. And what is the best matchup for the Saints in the first round of the playoffs? We'll discuss the options as we answer your questions next. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. Kevin Coleman, the lone running back behind Ryan. Gets the handoff right side, hit at the line of scrimmage and taken down. Monty Teo standing his ground. There'll be a loss on the play of one. Manti Teo filled in admirably for A.J. Klein on Sunday. Very disruptive, and Sean Mazan is here with us now to show us how Teo caused so much commotion against the Falcons. He was fantastic. He was fantastic. Merry Christmas. Same to you. Gentlemen. Papa times two. Fun day, indeed. <laughs> no doubt about that. When the Saints signed Manti Teo this offseason, I thought to myself, okay, but do they really need him? Well, here we are entering week 17 of the regular season, and the answer to that question is a resounding yes. With all the injuries, thank goodness he's here. On Sunday, he played his best game in black and gold. From a pre-snap play recognition standpoint, Teo is superb. It showed Sunday on his first tackle. Watch him clap his hands when he sees the receiver go in motion. And after Matt Ryan audibles, Teo creeps up to the line and perfectly times his burst through the gap just past West Schweitzer to tackle Devontae Freeman for a loss. From an athletic standpoint, many have viewed Teo as average, but he was plenty athletic when the Saints needed him Sunday. On the snap, Teo reads his keys and immediately sprints to his left and beats the right tackle to the landmark, shrugs off the block to stuff Tevin Coleman for the one-yard loss. His best sequence came at exactly the right time Sunday, just after Deion Jones intercepted Drew Brees early in the third quarter and brought the ball back to the Saints, too. On first and goal, Freeman took the handoff to the left. Teo is playing the opposite side of the direction of the play. It's quite the distance to travel, and Freeman looks like he has just the crease he needs to get into the end zone. But Teo gets over just in time to assist David Onyemata to make the tackle at the one-yard line. The next play is the perfect example of how great effort can lead to good luck. 
Keep your eye on Teo the entire time. He approaches the line and absolutely explodes through the block of Alex Mack, driving him straight back two yards. When he picks his head up, the ball, which was forced out from a hit from Tyler Davison, was laying on the turf for Teo to scoop up. Penalties were a huge factor in this game for the Falcons, and Teo forced two of them. Early in the game, on a big Freeman run, Teo's pursuit forced Jake Matthews to panic and hook him as he got closer. Teo may not have gotten there, but by hustling the way he did, he drew the flag and negated a big game. Later in the second quarter, Teo chased down Freeman again and would have gotten credit for yet another tackle for loss. However, Freeman stiff-armed Teo in the face mask, which drew a 15-yard penalty. The one thing that concerned me about A.J. Klein's injury was the recent slip in rush defense. The Saints had a below average few weeks and dipped to 18th in the NFL. But Teo's performance Sunday gave me confidence that they can survive without Klein. I think that's the storyline to watch as you go further. But look, we've been waiting for that game, waiting for that game. He, you, you saw him in splashes. That was the signature game of Manti Teo in a Saints uniform. He's coming off a torn Achilles tendon last year, right? Indeed. So he's come all the way back. Let's not forget Craig Robertson, too. I mean, he's he's in there for a, a former mm -hmm. starter. And Anzalone, what a, look at the job he's done, too. They've got so much more depth at that position than they've ever had. And they invested in it, and it's coming up right now. You're right about that. Let's get you right to the questions. But again, a final play app, final word feature on that app. And this one comes from Tina in Lakeview. If we win against Tampa next week, which NFC wildcard team, Panthers, Falcons, or Seahawks, would be a good matchup for the Saints? Well, I'm going to say the Falcons. Uh, their production offensively has really dropped off this year. They are 0-6 when they don't score 20 points. Last year, they averaged 34 points per game. It's down to 22 now. And their receivers, you saw this yesterday in the Lattimore interception, have had a hard time holding onto the ball. They've got 24 drops by their receivers. That's fourth most in the NFL. Ryan has been intercepted 11 times. Seven of those were his receiver's fault by either running the wrong pattern or dropping the ball or having it go off their hands in a pass that could have been completed. I actually agree with that, but I'm going to just make, make the case for the Panthers right here because that's the most likely candidate uh, for the Saints to play. Uh, I know Greg Olson will return in this game. The Saints didn't play in the first two weeks, and that's huge because he's been a Saints killer in the past. Uh, however, he's had one good game since he's been back. Uh, the nine-catch performance against Green Bay. He had three catches for 27 yards uh, on Sunday. But Cam Newton has been erratic. Mm -hmm. 160 uh, last week, 242 against Green Bay, great, four touchdowns, 137 against Minnesota, 183 against the Saints, 168, 11 for 28 uh, against the Jets. He's still an elite runner, but it feels like if you can somewhat contain that, you have a good chance at beating Cam Newton and the Panthers, which the Saints have already done twice this season. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say what the kids say. Both of y'all are so cray. Okay. <laughs> because both of you are wrong. Okay. I'm going to say the Seahawks. One, because it would be in the Dome and not in Seattle. That's key. And two, I think the Saints can run on a Seahawks team that's given a bunch of yards mm -hmm. up the past mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Last three weeks against the Cowboys, Rams, and Jags, they've given up 528 yards rushing. That's a 176 average. The Saints were forced to prove they can stop Kamara and Ingram. I don't think they can. And on offense, I think the Seahawks are still, and maybe more this year than years past, one-dimensional. It's Russell Wilson and no one else. I know Jimmy Graham's out there as well, but they don't use Jimmy Graham the way the Saints use Jimmy Graham. That's an offense, and we saw it against the Cowboys last night. If Russell Wilson struggles, they will struggle as a team. So I think this is the one year where I wouldn't mind playing Seattle in the Superdome. Hmm. Well put. I feel like I should drop the mic. You know, Mike. I might, I might change my choice now, Juan. Yeah, you've almost that. convinced me. Well, you know, I, that's a drop the mic moment. <laughs> How about the Rams? As, as a team that, mm. that's a difficult opponent, yep. but they've, they've shown some chinks in the armor. Well, they got San Francisco this week, and San Francisco's 4-0 and since they inserted Jimmy Garoppolo at quarterback, so they're no longer the pushover they looked to be four or five games ago. That'd be an interesting matchup. I, I think that would be the toughest of all these guys, yeah, to I be honest too. with you. I think, especially since you'd probably, for that to happen, I, I believe the Saints would have to go to L.A., so the Saints would be the five seed at that point. I, I, don't, I don't like that matchup at all, and I, I think that would be a tough one for the Saints. I think I don't like it either because look at where the Saints usually struggle against teams on the front line, mm -hmm. and the Rams are really good about getting pressure on the edges and up, yep. up, the, up the middle gap. I just think that'd be a difficult place for them to win. Um, but again, I think his Saints team is built to win anywhere this year because they take a different approach to playing this year. Well, Todd Gurley's back to being what he was a couple yes. of years ago. He was fantastic that, yesterday. Yesterday was unbelievable. <sighs> he might be the MVP in the league this year. 
You're right about that. All right, let's get on with the show here. Stick around, Sean. Much more with you when we come back in just a minute. Also, Drew Brees and Ted Ginn connected yesterday for the longest passing touchdown of the season. Has the offense stabilized enough from their injuries to support a playoff run? We'll debate that and look ahead to the Bucks when we come back. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. Here's Breeze stepping up and delivering. He's got 10, 10, 21, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! We've seen plenty of that this year. Breeze, again, it's been a very good combination. Welcome back in. Knowing what we know now, let's revisit some of the storylines this week. We want to talk about offense, being healthy and happy again. Again, Thomas, uh, Kamara, all those guys back and feeling good and being productive. Top three pass catchers yesterday. Yeah, and, you know, Ginn had that rib injury. He came back. Uh, Thomas supposedly tweaked his hamstring in the course of the week. Uh, he was uh, perhaps questionable coming into the game. That's a big loss there, yes, though. Yes, it is. Teron Armstead just can't stay healthy. We've talked about this a lot. Nobody means more to that offensive line, but just because they've been able to mix and match with Calamete and guys moving around and Pete being as versatile as he is and Ramchak, they've overcome that. But, boy, you'd like to see him healthy for the uh, I'm right there with around. you. It's tough because even when he's healthy, it feels like they're at a point in the game he's had to leave games uh, uh, multiple times this season. And while they've been able to manage, you certainly want to be full force at that offensive line when the playoffs get here because this is a new Saints team. This is a physical Saints team, and it's led on offense by that, by that offensive line. So you certainly want to get him back uh, healthy and ready to go. But he's played through so many injuries this year as well. I mean, even the ones, he doesn't talk about it very much. He just goes out and plays. He does that. There's nobody tougher, but, um, you know, he's had, what, the pectoral injury. I think it was he's a thigh, had, this, he's uh, a thigh on Sunday. Now, yeah. quad. He's had all sorts of problems in, in all sorts of areas. So... I don't know. Just like to have him back fully. The, the Saints are used to offensive line issues yeah. in, terms, in terms of injury, so they've been able to manage. We'll Talk see. about the job Peyton's done and mm -hmm. that offensive line piecing it together. All right. So last week the Saints had six guys named to the Pro Bowl, the most since the Super Bowl <coughs> year in 2009, when they had a franchise best seven. Michael Thomas was in that number this time, and that got us thinking. When's the last time a Saints receiver had been invited to the Pro Bowl? You have to go way back to Joe Horn in 2004 mm. when he got the call. But look at the guys that got passed over. All had legit arguments for being mm -hmm. in. Catches, yards. You see Marcus Colston in 07, Brandon Cooks in 16, Brandon Cooks in 15, and Colston again in 2012. What they all share in common there, at least 78 catches, at least 1,100-plus yards. And Mike Thomas with 98 catches right now in a game to go on pace to get 1,228 yards. I'll ask you two guys, first off, the, the year that Michael Thomas is having is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Maybe more than what we expected in year number two. He was great in his rookie year. Yeah, you knew he was going to be the go-to guy this year in the absence of Brandon Cooks, but he wasn't, even though Ginn has had his moments, he really hasn't been that complimentary speed mm -hmm. burner on the other side of the line of scrimmage. People know that it's going to be Michael Thomas. It's going to be Michael Thomas on third down in all sorts of clutch situations. He continues to impress. But, you know, you look at that group. You, uh, when I thought of Marcus Colston, you think of a big guy making tough catches over the middle, uh, mostly a possession receiver. I hadn't realized he scored as many touchdowns as he did. Back in 2007, he had 11 touchdowns. In 2012, he had 10. 98 catches the first year, 83 in the second. There's a guy whose statistics were deserving of going to the Pro Bowl, but as we were talking about in the office, may maybe there were just a lot of candidates having good years at that position those years. Look, I'm a huge Marcus Colson advocate, and I'm not, there's no bigger fan than me. His stats were not just Saints good, they were NFL good, and the narrative hurt him. The narrative with him was always average receiver that Drew Brees made better, and that was such so unfair to a guy like Marcus Colson. No one, and I mean no one, made more tougher catches, more tough catches for their quarterback than Marcus Colson. He took plenty of big shots over his career, so Marcus Colson should, be, should have been a pro bowler. And never promoted himself. Ever. Yeah, Marcus Colson, my, one of my favorite players mm -hmm. all the time. We talk about success for a football team. Stability at the head coaching position matters as well. Since 2008, the NFC South, Dirk Cutter, he may be out, but you look at this, only one coaching change for the Saints since 2008. When you look at the Falcons, they've had two different head coaches, the Panthers two, the Bucks five, and they've gotten to the playoffs none. So having stability at the head coaching position matters when it comes to postseason opportunities, right? Yeah, and you look at what the Buccaneers are going through now. Uh, looks like Dirk Cutter is going to be gone after two years. Uh, they've really fallen off this year. Jameis Winston has really fallen off. And now John Gruden looks better than he ever did. Uh, he was leaving after 2008 when they had a 9-7 and seven record. Mm -hmm. He got fired off a 9-7 and seven record. 
Yeah, I, I think that, that that graphic right there was very telling. Stability matters, and it leads to victories and leads to wins. It leads to playoffs and big-time success. You know, the Falcons, the Panthers, and Saints have had success over these last five, ten years. Bucks since John Gruden have kind of fallen off a little bit. It looks like they'll be looking again. Sean, thank you very much. Thank you. Nice job again, as always. Coming up, the last time the Saints and Bucks faced off, <laughs> the world was in introduced to Jameis Winston's curious pregame speech about Eden W's. And a blowout got testy thanks to the third year quarterback. We'll preview the week 17 matchup coming up. You're watching the Jim Anderson Black and Gold Review. Saints made it look easy in the dome back on November 5th. Now it's totally different. Just win. Just win, baby. Just win. And you got a team in the Buccaneers who've lost a couple of tough games in the last two weeks. Uh, they would probably pack it in if you gave them a chance. We'll see how much fight they come out with on Sunday and how many fans are there. This is yesterday's game against the Panthers. They were terrible on special teams. They allowed this 103-yard kickoff return. Their kicker has a hard time reaching the end zone with his kickoffs. He's missed a couple of 50-plus yard field goals late in both of the last two losses that could have sent the game to overtime, perhaps won them. Uh, they have no pass rush. They have no running game. Yesterday, Winston was sacked seven times. He fumbled three times. They're dead last in pass defense, but you know the Panthers only had 140 net yards passing against them. But this is a team ready to be beaten, ready to uh, close out the season, and probably ready to fire their head coach, Dirk Cutter, after his second year with John Gruden perhaps waiting in the wings. That'll be a big point of discussion down in Tampa Bay this week and in the week after. Still got to win the game. Mm -hmm. Got to win the game. All right, that's going to do it for us. Until then, for Jim, Sean, and everyone here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. We thank you for watching. Our next newscast is at 4.30 in the morning. Have a great night. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the Jim Henderson Black and Gold Review.